welcome to Freshly Forever, a podcast that gives you fascinating insights week after week. Here's your host, Vai Kumar. Hey folks, welcome to another episode on podcast Freshly Forever. Today I have a returning guest here on the show, Melanie Flores. She is an engineer, two-time TEDx speaker, e-commerce business co-founder, and has brought to life several ideas from scratch in her extremely passionate STEM journey. Melanie is now the Director of Solutions Consulting at SimTrain, a SaaS company that's focused on role play training. She is also the creator of a kindergarten engineering design workshop based on a famous MIT course. We'll, of course, talk about that in today's discussion. And Melanie has done STEM coaching, serving 48 Easter Seals. Hey, Melanie, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me, Bye. It's so nice to catch up with you again. And this time I thought we just definitely need to leverage your expertise and passion for STEM because there's so many uh, women entrepreneurs that could take a leaf out of your book. Plus so many girls in STEM still, you know, are skeptical and wondering, Hey, STEM right for me. So I just thought we definitely need to use your expertise here on the show again, uh, because you have brought to life several ideas from scratch and kudos to you for doing all of that. You are a two-time TEDx speaker as well. So from a college student in chemical engineering at MIT to an intern later and then to a career bringing, like I said, several ideas to life, and now with a SaaS company, why don't you take us through your journey, Melody? Sure. I guess um, my life has been a big corkscrew. I've just been, I've, I have not traced a straight path between any two points ever. I would uh-huh. say I, I've pretty much just followed wherever I saw an opportunity to do something new and different where I thought I'd learn something and where I thought I'd be doing something um, not ordinary. <laughs> that's always uh-huh. attracted me. So it, that that's kind of been my guiding principle um, from starting up a factory. To, to, but that's an unusual opportunity to going into the preschool classroom. Again, that's a, that's not something you would expect. So of course that attracted me uh, to, mm-hmm. to starting a business with my son. So I think that's been the common thread is just anything that, that sounded new where I thought I'd be plunging myself into something that where I would be forced to learn something new. That's that's like, like a moth to a flame. That's how to get me to <laughs> to try something or to, to, to make a switch. Okay. So why don't you exactly take listeners through the steps in your journey? You know, you were a student at MIT and then what happened subsequently? Well, so I first was a, uh, when I first graduated, I was, uh, I worked for a pharmaceutical company and I was helping retrofit a factory to make a cholesterol reducing drug. And i enjoyed that because I found myself climbing scaffolding and, and like trying to figure out how to connect pipes and, and having to, to figure out like, how would I change this facility to make this new drug? So I knew that what I was important and was going to help people with, and it was, it was a little out of the ordinary. I wasn't going to be stuck in an office or in a cubicle. I actually had to go out there and trace the pipes and actually examine the equipment and look at it. So I found that really interesting, that work. Uh huh. Certainly um, so impactful because, you know, after all, you know, how many Americans or how many people all over the world wrestle with cholesterol issues and heart conditions, right? So, yeah, that was, so that was, I enjoyed doing that. And then um, I, I ended up pivoting because I got engaged and my fiance and I both ha- got job offers to go to Alaska, actually to work for an, an oil company in Alaska. And again, that was something that attracted me. It's like, wow, what, imagine living there. And we thought of it as a, as a huge opportunity to just do something wild. And so, and to be honest, like to, in order to attract people to live up there. It was a it was a, a very attractive salary considering we were just fresh out of school. So mm-hmm. um, he and I, after we got married, we we moved up there. We started working up there and that was pro- that was a very memorable way to start our marriage. At the first year of our marriage, we were up there and we got to see uh, I would say one of the most beautiful states in this country and live there. Then what happened? They started having layoffs and mm-hmm. we decided you know what, we're, uh, we're probably, it was probably like last in, first out. And we also, uh, 
knew that we probably aren't going to live there forever. We, you know, we want, we went up there with a sense of adventure, but we also knew that we were probably not going to stay there for too long. So we decided, well, let's just see what we could find. We ended up getting recruited by Corning. And so I went to work for Corning, he and I, uh, as a production supervisor. So this was, this was at Corning's um, optical fiber facility in Wilmington, North Carolina. And they were looking for, um, they were looking for STEM professionals to actually become production supervisors. Um, so we would learn the business and how it worked and then eventually move into an engineering role. So mm-hmm. again, that sounded very unusual and like, oh, this is a chance. So we, so I took, uh, I ended up taking a position as a production supervisor. I was in my early twenties, but I was in charge of a shift of 24 operators. Most of them, in fact, almost all of them were old enough to be my parents. <laughs> um, and, and I was responsible for my shift. We ran 24 uh, seven, we worked in 12 hour shifts. So um, I learned what it was like to work in a 24 seven facility, be responsible for production during my shift um, to, it was a union environment. So I learned a lot about, uh, about working in that kind of environment. And it was also just a great culture. I mean, Corning has a wonderful culture. I learned a ton there. And some of the sharpest people I've ever worked with all were at Corning. So I, I was really lucky uh, to be able to, to be in that environment. And then sure enough, after a year, then I did move, I moved into engineering. And at the time, you know, the optical fiber business was booming. So they realized that they needed to start up a second plant. They decided to start up a plant in the Charlotte area. And I got tapped to be on that team to start up that plant. And again, that, that was how nice, again, an opportunity to do something really wild. Like, can you please take this and turn it into, you know, it was, it was just a, it it starts, it started as a field. And then we, we had to put the machines in, we had to start it up. We had to hire all the people. We had to have a training done. We had to hire, train and get, get all the machines up and going and that was exciting to me. Again, it's not a, just a boring, ordinary nine to five job. It was, we need you to start up this factory. We, we, we are, and we are trusting, you know, they tapped me and actually my husband as well. But there was a, a group of people that got tapped to go over there and be part of the startup crew. And it was probably, it was one of the hardest I've ever worked in my life because we were working uh, pretty much till 11, 12, 1, 1 a.m. And then I'd wake up and go into the plant at five or six a.m. It was mm-hmm. like that for 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 weeks and weeks on end until we finally got the plant running. But once we got that running, it was it was amazing. It was like once we finally had our first yeah fiber, fruit of your labor, right? So, oh my gosh, yeah. the whole everyone there was working. It was like it was like we'd won the Super Bowl. We were all cheering, and I'll never forget it ever. It was very hard work, but um, I will I would never trade that experience for anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so from that on to working with the younger school kids in Montessori, how did you think kids that young could do some of the stuff that you kind of envisioned for them? You know, like it was like a design workshop based on a famous MIT course, correct? So. How did even that transition from a factory setup to a school environment happen? Was that subsequently to <laughs> uh, subsequent to parenthood? And how did you even think kids? How did I end up there? Do Is stuff? Basic... <laughs> you want to know how did I end up be, going from working in a? I went from being an engineering manager at a at a twenty four seven manufacturer facility to suddenly teaching like three-year-olds years late. Like, how did I make that transition? Well, the, the way it happened is, uh, well, actually after 9-11 happened, my husband and I, we were, we, we were, we had no children and we were just very career focused. And then after 9-11 happened, I, I, I just started thinking about what do I really want to do with my life? You know, you don't know how long you have, you never know. And I saw, mm-hmm. us, I, I did want to have children at some point. And I realized that it's, you know, you just, it's now or never. Corny started to have um, like downsizing because the telecom industry was slowing down around the same time that 9-11 happened. I was starting to get longings to just do something different. And, to, and I was thinking about having kids. So all those things together started happening at the same time. And to me, I said, this is a sign. It's time for a change. So we started a family. My husband went to business school. I became a stay-at-home mom. And mm-hmm. for six, we ended up having two children. And for Six years, I was actually home with both of them, and I fully immersed myself in um, 
all kinds of things with them when they were little. What made me end up going back into the workforce was when we, uh, my husband ended up getting transferred to, to Boston and we started looking at schools and I wanted, I wanted our older son to go to Montessori school. Uh, we had read that it was a, a, a unique and excellent way of educating young children. And so when we looked for schools, I asked the school um, how I could get more involved I wanted to continue to be involved and, and, and to be a part of their lives um, as much as possible, even while they were in school. So I was thinking, maybe I could volunteer or something. And they actually said, we happen to have one of our assistant teachers just submit her resignation. Are you are you interested in, in, in being an assistant teacher? <laughs> and so oh. I, I thought, well... I'm trained as an engineer. Uh, I said, I'm, I don't have training. And they said, oh, well, this is in Montessori. We, uh, you as an assistant teacher are not providing the lessons. You're not providing the direct instruction. You're supporting the lead teacher and helping him or her uh, behind the scenes. You're providing all the support with the, with, the, with the students or with the classroom, with the environment. You yourself don't have to deliver lessons. So therefore, you don't actually need to be trained as a Montessori teacher. And I thought, Okay. And again, this was an example of, I think I'm going to learn something. I think this is like kind of out there, which kind of always has always attracted me. Like this is a chance to learn something that's out there. So I said, okay. (laughs) And when you said your career was non-linear and it had (laughs) taken like a zigzag path, no wonder, you know, all this transformation from say like MIT to internship somewhere, then you know, taking a first job at a pharmaceutical company, then setting up a factory, then moving again to, you know, just uh, do it elsewhere. And then parenthood and finally yet another journey, right? So it's just (laughs) fascinating, Melanie. And but how do you think as a support teacher, as an assistant teacher in that Montessori, where from did you even think that kids that young could do stuff? Because I, as a parent, I can imagine what prompted you to, you know, kind of think you wanted to be more involved in the school? I guess all of us that are creative and that are like kind of want to do something different, I guess we tend to want to volunteer in schools. And I have done that and I can clearly see that you wanted to do it. But how come you thought that kids could do something to the level that you have made them do? Because your TED Talk, can you learn engineering in kindergarten? That was TEDx Jacksonville, correct? So yes. you talk about how support system parents need to nurture young minds. So where from did this idea come to life? And why don't you tell us all about it? When I became an assistant teacher, one of the hallmarks of Montessori education is just observing the child. And a good Montessori um, guide or teacher knows each one of his or her students and knows where they are developmentally. And you only know that by observing them, just sitting there and watching them and seeing how they interact with the materials in the classroom and what do they struggle with. And I, all that time that I spent in the classroom as assistant teacher, just watching children, not just in the classroom, but on the playground, I started to, I got super fascinated with, with, with young children and their, their fearlessness and the way they would think about things. And I realized that uh, we often, we underestimate them. Like we, one of the things that young children have as a superpower is their lack of uh, baggage and their, their belief that they can do anything. They don't think they have any limitations. And they also, I find their thought process just fascinating. Just like, I liked watching what they would gravitate towards. And, and I would ask them questions about their work and just I thought that there was something there that we are not, that we just tend to dismiss or overlook or not even think is there. So the way that that definitely some untapped yeah. potential, right? Absolutely. So, that people don't even realize. Do yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And actually come to think of it. I just thought this was a conversation that would kind of trigger a lot of minds in becoming women entrepreneurs, like in becoming women product leaders in companies and for young girls to think there's endless possibilities with STEM and get inspired to become more successful in STEM. But here you are, your journey is also lending this new dimension that Montessori teachers 
how much they could do, right? When you work mm-hmm. with kids, your journey begins right then, triggering someone's creativity and bringing it all to life and being like a helping hand in just encouraging and fostering and nurturing that stuff. It's just something phenomenal. So I'll just let you take over again and kind of <laughs> tell us all about what you did with the children, because that's just a fascinating thing to listen to. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, uh, they, I saw h- how creative they could be and how fearless they were. So I had become a preschool assistant teacher um, in 2009. And I would say after a few years there, I started getting restless and wanting to 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 do something more with the children than d- them. And I, I started wanting to bring in STEM somehow. So I started doing it as an after school offering at the school. But I also thought, just doing it after school, you're only reaching a few kids, like 10, maybe 10, 15, however many. And it was usually just, um, sometimes it feels like people just would sign their kids up for after school because they, they couldn't pick their kids up until after they got off work. So where, what can I put my child in where they can just stay at school until I can come get them? So they would just pick a class and they would pick, sometimes they would pick mine. Uh-huh. And I and I kept thinking, yeah, well, that's great, but I felt like I w- I'm only really working with just a very small set, and it, uh, and I felt like uh, I could do more. I wanted to somehow impact all the children. <laughs> I wanted to find a way to to make it so that I could bring the magic of, of of design thinking and engineering to all the children, not just the ten or so whose parents happen to to need a place for their children to be and who thought, oh well that STEM is always good and they would sign up. I wanted it to be more intentional and I wanted there to be more impact. So what I saw was an opportunity because at the school where I worked, we we had this a kindergarten science fair. Honestly, all of my colleagues <laughs> they thought it was the most stressful thing ever. I mean, everyone knows that science fairs can be stressful and often kids end up roping their parents in, or I don't know, it ends up being this, this, this super stressful experience, no matter what grade you're in. And then, and then you know, yeah, it becomes like a project for the whole family, right? Yes, when it's, it's supposed to be a project for the kids. Yes, it's, it, it's crazy. I, and I have seen those the, the science fair projects where you could tell that the parent actually did it. And the kid all the all the child did was glue things on the board. It's like, they're not learning anything. It's just this dog and pony show. And all of my colleagues, like, they found it stressful as well because we had to orchestrate it. So I started thinking no one really liked having to deal with all that. I wanted to expose the children to engineering things. So I, so I actually thought, what if we replaced this kindergarten science fair project, which every kindergartner had to go through, with an engineering design project where I, uh, I could walk them through the process and I actually, I thought I basically borrowed a concept from MIT. There's this MIT um, sophomore mechanical engineering class where all the students get this, they, they get a box full of parts and they have to build a robot out of those parts. And I thought, why don't we just, why don't I see if I can make a, a young child version of that? And, and, and we could do that. And so I, whatever your friend Scott did at MIT, you just wanted you know the <laughs> children to be able to do, right? Yeah, I did. I wasn't going to give them like circuit boards or anything like that. It was good, but I was going to give them the same experience of, look, you have to design something that accomplishes a task. And I gave them simple things like bubble wrap and, and duct tape and cardboard and, and things like that. And they had to design something. But anyway, I just thought, why don't we do that? And I basically said, and I'm willing to lead the whole thing. I just need your help. I, I told all my colleagues, I said, please, I can't do this alone. I need your help. Can you partner with me? And I am willing to lead this whole thing. And they're all like, oh, we could get rid of the science there. <laughs> and I said, and we just had, you know, we, we could help you. So I said, let's do this. So we did it. And um, it actually ended up being one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And everyone enjoyed it. All the kids loved it, the parents. And for two years, we ran this program. And then I ended up, you know, moving. I only did the program for two years, but I did leave the groundwork so that they could continue it. That's how I ended up doing the kindergarten engineering design workshop with kindergartners. And they ended up making, instead of robots from the MIT stuff, you know, the actual class in your kindergarten class, the kids made shoes out of all the junk material that you would give them, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And they would. um, Okay. And they would do a presentation and all of that after. So how much do you think, you know, there was this real creative genius in that child coming out versus someone else at home helping them finish that project or putting it all together? So every single child, there were over the course of two years, 
there were 88 kindergartners who went through the program. And my colleagues and I, we, we took pictures of them doing the work. It was all done in school. There was no parental involvement. This was all their work. They designed the shoes. They documented their work. And the way that we taught the kindergartners how important it is to document their work was I, I said, this is kind of like a baby book. You know how your parents take pictures of you and they want to just see how you're progressing? Well, you're going to take a baby book, but this is of your work, of your, your shoe. And, and you want to capture the progression of how, of how your shoe evolved. You know, I didn't say evolved over time. I just said how your how your shoe changed over time, just like your parents do that. And, I, and then I said, you also need to be able to communicate your work. I said, engineers um, need to be able to communicate their work and their rationale. So we're, you're going to do the same thing. And um, we're going to just take your book that you're making and we'll turn it into a movie. It's going to be like a movie because I'm going to show it on the big screen and then your parents are going to come in and watch and you'll be able to share it. And so it was explained in a way that is very child friendly. And I'm just really proud of the fact uh, that all of the children, every single one rose to the occasion. So, you know, they, they made us all so proud. Not a single child um, backed out. We had people expressing their doubts like, oh, you you're going to ask a five-year-old to do that, like give a presentation. They're probably going to say they're sick on the day they're supposed to do it, or, or they're going to start crying and hide under the table. I had a couple people say, oh, oh my, uh-huh. my daughter's not. Guess what? They all did it. And they were all so proud of their work. And so uh, I just got to say that we don't give children, young children enough credit. And we don't, we, we need to let them own their work. We need to let them wrestle with, with designing things and trying ideas and then, ex- and then understanding why their ideas didn't work and documenting. It's all just a story. It's basically all, it, it was all a story. I told them they were all writing stories about how they created a shoe. And I said that if, if your shoe failed, I said, that actually is a very interesting story. You just need to explain why it failed. I said, in fact, if your shoe is successful in the first try, that's, that's pretty boring. You didn't really do engineering because you didn't solve any problems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting, right? Teachers can be make or can really make or break. And I always feel that it's in the hands of the teacher to kind of propel someone's journey forward. And there are so many people that are doing that as educators. It's, it's just phenomenal what you did with kindergartners and with your own children at home, which we'll come to, you know, because the business that your son started and you co-founded with him, that's again, like a, um, another phenomenal story. So it's just very, very interesting to know what teachers can do to kind of propel the ideas and, you know, just get it just rolling further and further, right? And then, you know, that just transforms an individual. Whoever thought, hey, I don't have the confidence to do it. All of a sudden, like you said, there were children that the parents said wouldn't even present and would go hide themselves in a corner. Sure enough, it didn't happen. You know, Mm -hmm. it just was a transformational piece, right? And of course, those parents are going to be forever thankful to a Melanie Flores (laughs) for for, you know, just instigating those skills in that, in that child. And so how important are design thinking skills in a school curriculum? And most importantly, you found out and you proved that starting them young is really important, right? So what would you say to that, Melanie? Whether it's at home or at school, we need to give children the time and the space and the freedom to try crazy ideas even if they might fail. And we need to be open to them to, to them failing and just letting them know we'll support you just as long as you learn from your failures. I think that when we give them that room to experiment and we encourage them to do that both at home and at school, I think we're building in them like just lifelong confidence. That's how you instill design thinking in young people. You start them young and you give them time and space. The other thing that I would say is that to give your children time to get bored at home. Don't over schedule them. Let them get bored. In fact, I think them getting bored is one of the best things you can do. Like I, when I was a teacher, I actually remember one little girl who would, she started crying one day and I asked her why. And she basically said, she just feels like all she does is she goes from school to like violin to uh, like this math tutoring, like this, 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 she doesn't even have time to do anything. Then she eats and then it's time for something else. And like, there is no time for her to just be a five-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. And she was crying. She didn't even want, she didn't, it was the end of the day. She actually didn't want to go home. I think that's sad. 
I do. I think that uh, we need to give your, you need to let them get bored. And, and that's when they're bored. In fact, when I'm bored, that's when I come up with my best ideas. Sometimes when I, when I'm not occupying myself with, with my phone or something else, and I just let myself be, sometimes that's where the ideas come. Let your children mm-hmm. just have that. Yeah. Does frustration then, is that like a sign of fostering creativity? Does frustration breed creativity? Yes. Does a dull moment in someone's life breed creativity? Yes. And you really talked about confidence as, right? What about uh, building spatial thinking? And you beautifully said engineering design process map and whatnot, you know? So how does all of this, you know, like when, even when the children did it in your classroom, say they had to kind of do like a step-by-step process map or whatever, right? Of course, in their own childlike way, in their Mm -hmm. own, you know, three, four-year-old or five-year-old mind, whatever that mindset could do. So how much are we also helping them build on their spatial thinking aside from this as a confidence building activity? Are you asking, like, how could we do it? How can you encourage children to develop spatial thinking? Well, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And when you do these kind of stuff, how do you see that translate into results when it comes to, you know, you seeing them actually having developed those skills? One of the most valuable things a person can learn professionally is how to turn an idea that's in their head into a reality. You can help a child develop that skill when they're as young as three, all you have to do is is ask them to build something and give them simple parts, but ask them to draw it first. Tell you know, have them draw it and then try to build it. And what they build might not match what they drew, but then they can go back and revise the drawing. Or you know, regardless, that whole act of putting a pencil to paper and drawing what's in your head. That is a huge step. That's a step that even adults struggle with. Well, like think of people our age who have ideas, but they never do anything with them. Well, the first step is like, write it down. Well, that's all you're doing mm-hmm. with a little kid is like, draw what you think you're going to build. So all you're doing is it's that exact same muscle. Once that young child draws what they want to build and they actually build it, that's a confidence builder because then they see, oh, well, here's this idea I had. And look, I actually made something it doesn't match, but at least I'm, I, I've got the process going. It's the same thing with an adult. Sometimes with us, the, you just need something to get you going. You, you, you write the business plan or you, you write whatever it is that you think you're going to do. And then you actually start doing something with it. So again, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Process design, it's an iterative process, right? At least it makes you want to go back and refine it. And so that you can just, you know, at least you know what worked, what didn't work in the first place. And, and just you have started something which makes your brain also want to go back to that activity. And definitely, it just breeds a lot of creativity. Back in a moment with our guest on Fresh Leaf Forever. Your other TEDx talk, where you just encourage girls to find role models, STEM gems, as you call it. Why don't you talk about all of that and allowing girls to get their hands on activities and, you know, getting their hands dirty and your own journey as a middle school, high school child, getting your hands dirty and that great amoeba hunt in that jar of water was a scientist moment for you in school, correct? So why don't you talk about the importance of getting girls to do hands-on activities, focusing on your other beautiful TEDx talk? Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So I, I do think it's important for girls to to actually um, do something with their hands and so to, to build the spatial thinking and spatial awareness. And uh, STEM gems, actually, that's actually a term from um, one of my connections and friends. Her name's Stephanie Espy. She wrote a book called STEM Gems. So I can't claim credit for, or, mm-hmm. for that term, but I, I love her book. She's always trying to find uh, role models to put in front of young girls so they can see what's possible. I think it's important to, to make sure girls know that robotics and building things is not just for boys. And I think that's that we need to let them work on projects around the house 
gloves that involve like picking up a drill or a screwdriver or a saw so they can handle just as well. In fact, one of my friends has a daughter who uh, works on cars. And I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That young lady is very confident. I think it's important to give your daughters that kind of opportunity and let them develop that, that confidence. One thing that I regret is that when I was young, my grandfather and my father built a playhouse for me and my sisters in the backyard. I don't know, it didn't even occur to me to go out there and pick up a hammer and help them. I just watched them. And now looking back, I think, why didn't that occur to me? I, I, I wish that I had helped build it. Because I remember my grandfather drawing the plans and showing me, he said, look, I'm going to build this for you and your sisters. And he was so proud of himself. And then he and my dad built it mm-hmm. and we played in it. But um, I, don't know, I, I feel like um, if I could go back in time, I would, the nine-year-old that I was, I, I would have said, Lolo, can I help? I bet he would have let me help. Uh-huh. Like, and I wish, you know, I don't know why he didn't, he didn't think to ask me either. I mean, I guess we all just, they just went and did it and I watched and, and I, I think that that's, um, that's unfortunate, but. Well, so. you have planted several process seeds and uh, ideas and you have seen them come through uh, to life, including Corning's optical fiber factory. So how about creating processes that would help business scale? How was that journey for you? And what would you say to women entrepreneurs or women in the workforce that are just going up the ladder for them to just derive a leaf out of your book? Oh, let's see. I, uh, I'm trained as a chemical engineer. And I have a, so as a result, I have a very strong bias for process. Mm-hmm. The only way that you can have a repeatable process is to document it. And then if you change it, you change the document. But that's the only chemical factory that can produce the same thing every time. And, and you have consistency from batch to batch. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same thing with a business. If you want your business to scale... You need to document everything you do in your business and then any change, you change the documentation. It's the exact same thinking. One thing that that I've tried to do um, in in my work is everything that I've done, um, well-documented. And the other thing that I try to do, maybe it's a little different, is um, having, now that I've been a parent and I've also worked with young children, um, I tend to try to put uh, some element of playfulness in everything that I do. So that's something I think is unique that that, um, maybe not everyone does that in my uh, role is I try to bring a little bit of playfulness to every process and uh, to make work fun. Interesting, right? So it has to, there has to be some element of interest and some element of something to look forward to every single time, unless you Mm -hmm. keep things dynamic. Yeah, I'm also a firm believer in documenting stuff and that it's always easy for knowledge transfer and for repeatability and scalability. I think that's a great tip right there. How about some organizations that help in girls reaching their target goal with STEM and for even for women in STEM. I know there's this organization, Girls with Impact, that helps young girls start their entrepreneurial journey and things like that, right? So helping girls find role models in STEM, after what do you think they can go after? I mean, I think it's important for girls to, to have role models, even just um, in their own circle. And it doesn't have to be someone doing something super life changing. It could just be something that just helps others. It works in the lab, like explaining what they do. We tend to think that role models for girls, it it has to be like this luminary who you bring in for a field trip, or it could be, I want you to meet, you know, so-and-so and and let me arrange. It's not the cloud bursts that create canyons. It's like the slow and steady trickle. And so having someone in your life and in your normal uh, orbit is that slow and steady trickle that, that will eventually carve a canyon. It's not that cloudburst. It's not that awesome luminary who came into your child's classroom and talked for 20 minutes when they were in eighth grade. That person that might impress them for a little bit, but it's it's more just the uh, the everyday people in there um, who they have access to. Mm-hmm. That's beautifully said because I think anyone with X ray eyes can really you know derive a lot of inspiration and a lot of messaging that the normal everyday person. I mean, you brought up a great example: someone working at a hospital lab. That's against them because right there, one can just derive ideas. It can just be transforming. It can make them feel like, hey, I'm empty empowered now. It just can be Mm -hmm. a valued feeling, right? What do you think are some focus areas then for school and college students going forward? And again, for educators and newer technology and stuff like that, both from the standpoint of a parent and from your own work experience, 
and whatever you see changing in the world. So one thing that people try to encourage young people to go into STEM, and I'm included, my own, my own children are um, both interested in STEM, but I think that what we don't talk enough about and what I am seeing is, is really the game changer for a person uh, once they are out in the world is actually their ability to communicate, to be, to engage storytelling. You could have two STEM professionals, like two people who are doing amazing work in their fields and one person doesn't communicate very well and the other person does. The, the person who's going to make the bigger impact, even though they're both doing amazing work in the field of STEM, is going to be the person who can communicate and tell the, and tell a story in a way that that grabs at people's emotions and captures their attention. I can't even tell you how many times like I had classmates at MIT who uh, they were brilliant, but they couldn't really communicate. Basically, they end up not being recognized for their work because they can't, they can't get it out there, uh, which is sad. You have to be able to, to tell the story. You have to be able to, to be concise. You have to lose the jargon. You have to be able to, to connect with people's emotions for them to pay attention to you because it's only if they pay attention to you that your work will be recognized and that you that you will actually be able to make a difference. Okay. And so would AI, blockchain, crypto, NFTs, so much coming up, right? Would you just point mm-hmm. to one specific area for anyone that's in science, technology, engineering, and math? And what is it that you think is going on with folks that have a strong dislike for like, say, physics or chemistry? Is that like because of the curriculum? the nature of the curriculum or what's going on there for a non-STEM enthusiast? There's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> like, like, if you're not if you're not wired to enjoy it, there is something else that that is meant out there for you. So I, I believe that that there is a, a, a right direction for everyone, and I don't believe everyone should go into STEM. It's not right for everyone, but for those who do go into STEM, which is a ripe field, and we, you know we we need people in that profession. For the people who do go into it, I think it's important for them to just know that the communication skills is what's gonna is is what's gonna propel them beyond all of their peers who are also in STEM. Mm -hmm. But would you say, hey, okay, this I think is where the direction is trending. Just focus as a high school student, focus on any particular area or things like that. Mm. Well, I I mean, I definitely think computer science is a great, that's definitely a great field to go into. That will only grow. The demand for that will grow as well as cybersecurity and anything using AI. I mean, even where I work now, we use AI. So that is a a hot field and that is a a great place to, to dive into for anyone who's young and looking to go into a STEM career. Those would be three areas that, I, that I'd look at. Also, anything with healthcare, as our population ages and people are living longer, I think that we're going to need more solutions around how, how can we help people live longer lives, live healthier. I mean, anything that that is in the healthcare space, particularly around um, the aging, that's going to be, that. I think that's a, a, a great opportunity. Okay. What about your journey with OctoGifts, the e-commerce venture that you co-founded with your son, Sebastian, and We had both Sebastian and you on this show to talk about that journey. And it was a very extremely well-received episode all over the world. So how would you think, you know, nurturing the creative skills in your son to start a company? How was that experience? And how did you see him transform from the elementary school to middle school child that he was into becoming a business owner and subsequently even kicking you out, right? So the... (laughs) And the transformation, the him acquiring those skills and two patented products. Is that right? Well, he has two patents. It's the same product, OctoGives. He's got a design patent and a utility patent, but it's for the same. It's still for OctoGives. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, so how was that? Oh, that, <laughs> that was just another example of uh, of something wild and crazy that was out there that I knew like that this is kind of a wild adventure. So I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like starting up the plant, that was that's that's an out there adventure that not many people get a chance to do. Well, when my son asked me when when he asked me to help him start this business again, that was like, ooh, that sounds very interesting. I know nothing about it, but it sounds fun. So let's do it. So we decided to see how far we would take it, and I, I would describe the whole experience as I would say it was life changing for both him and me. And we again, it started with him having this idea in his head, and he drew it. 
And then he decided to try to make it a reality. And one thing that uh, that I like to say is the idea out in the world that failed is far more valuable than the idea that never leaves your head. How many people just never take the idea in their head and do anything with it? At least try it. And if it fails, you have already taken it farther than most who never even try the idea in their head. You have said it loud and clear so far. Yeah, I'm very passionate about like just putting it down <laughs> on a piece of paper. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I would uh, do it all over again. Yes, he did. He, he started started out uh, at age 13 doing this. And then uh, over time, you know, he, we built it together. And as he started entering middle teen years and then high school, he started, he started to grow out of it. He wanted to, to do new things, learn new things. And he also wanted to see what it was like if he had held the reins and didn't have me around. And he actually said, I think I'm going to learn more if I just come to you with questions. And that's when I said, are you firing me? Like, you kind of want me to go away. And he said, well, <laughs> sort of, but not really. I said, I still needed to do a couple. Like he wanted me to do some of the things that he considered boring, like the <laughs> bookkeeping and taxes and all that stuff. But he said, I want to be the one to kind of make the decision of the other things. And 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 I think I'm going to learn more from my own mistakes. And actually was right. He asked me to, to kind of step back. And so he could do more things. And he said, I might decide I don't want to do this anymore. And I want that to be okay. I want to have the freedom to try things and to, to just call the shots. And I said, okay, I handed the reins over to him. He continued with the Octo gifts for a little while. And then he decided um, I'm ready to learn new things. He does still have a website. He still gets approached to to speak to group. He's actually an exhibit at the Science Museum Oklahoma. <laughs> Oh, how a, nice. How nice. <laughs> so he's still getting he's still getting recognition for the work he did, but he's no longer actively selling product. He's and there there's several uh, academic areas that he's gotten super interested in that he wanted to just be able to channel himself into, which was hard to do when um when he was also running Octo gifts. Mhm. So. So how significant then you would you say based on your experience is entrepreneurship in a child's say high school life or starting it even earlier than that? How can we foster young innovators more and more of that? I think it's a I think that it's important to expose young children to as many unique opportunities as possible and get them in the habit of thinking about how things can be combined. What if we took that idea, but tried it in this space or that solution, but applied it to this problem, which is not something you would obviously associate with. That's because that's, I think, where business ideas come up. That's where your business opportunities are, is when you come up with a unique solution that maybe people even pay you for. So I think that starts there, like getting children and young people thinking entrepreneurially is uh, starts with getting them thinking about unique combinations. When you combine like seemingly unrelated solutions or situations and you're able to possibly solve a problem, that's where I think there's business gold. Mm -hmm. you're, you... that, that's just beautiful. Yeah. So I think it starts there. And I do think it's important to, to get kids, um, give them opportunities to spread their entrepreneurial wings. If you have a child who's willing to go mow lawns or um, create flyers or help people with the, you know, with IT issues, you know, have them try it, have them go, go for it and um, let them experience what it's like to try to, to, to earn a, the, an honest dollar from an idea of theirs. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, you know, go for internships, even at the high school level, correct? Mm -hmm, definitely. I think internships are awesome opportunities for young people. I've, I always try to get an intern at work and I encourage my own sons to, to look into them mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. to pursue them. That's super nice. What would you like to see high school teachers or other educators focus on in their curriculum, like having learned all the lessons from raising two sons and from whatever you're seeing from a work perspective in terms of where the world is trending and how the STEM side is trending. That I think the teacher should do is, is make sure that they're allowing space for failure and, and learning from the failure. I think you learn far more when I think I think that you learn far more when you fail, but you're able to dissect it and then share what you learned and apply it, allowing room for failure, um, but not just letting them fail and saying, oh, you failed. That's not enough. It, they, you need to encourage them to 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 think through why they failed and and, and share why, because I think that's where the, the, there's genuine learning to be had. Mm -hmm. But do you think the current uh, school system is uh, letting educators do that part? You know, are we able to even facilitate that kind of a practical approach to learning? Or do you think it's solely in the hands of some exceptional standout teachers to do their things differently and still be able to help the kids? Um, you know, I'd probably say as a whole, it's it, there. I think teachers who will, who do provide that space and that freedom, they're they're probably not the 
in the majority. I'll say that. Uh, but the, there are some who are, and those teachers are to be treasured. That's beautiful. And you have emphasized so much about the power of communication, digital media, and the power of storytelling. You're a phenomenal storyteller. I just enjoy every time you do a post on LinkedIn, there's always something to take away from it. And your interest and ability to create powerful narratives, Melanie, how come that that happened and your journey with SimTrain, which is a SaaS company. Why don't you talk about all of that and the power of storytelling, how it's an integral part of your job? Oh, well, so first of all, thank you for your kind words. Um, I do enjoy storytelling and always have. I uh, I think that um, it probably started when I mean, when I was a young girl, I actually loved reading. I used to chase the bookmobile when it when it came to my neighborhood. I loved <laughs> getting on the bookmobile and just picking out books. And um, so I've always had a love for story. And uh, I'm lucky that where I am now at SimTrain, we actually create simulations where people can practice conversations and situations. Well, guess what? It's sort of like writing a play. When you take people through uh, certain emotions as they're learning, they're more likely to learn it effectively. The learning is more likely to stick. Again, it's similar to storytelling. A good story draws the listener or the viewer in and engages their emotions. The same thing is true of effective learning. You will learn more effectively if, if you are engaged and you care. That's sort of how I, my childhood love for stories has ended up spilling over into my, le- my life even now and helping me in my career current role. Mm -hmm. SimTrain is a SaaS company. You're focused on role play training by engaging users in authentic work simulations, right? So how do you think that has helped translate into better go-to-market success for your end users? The way that we, that our software helps people learn how to deal with customers is that we actually provide simulations where it feels like you're actually speaking on the phone with a, a real person and the person on the other end of the line needs help or is upset about something. Sometimes, and sometimes where our software also is just providing like software navigation training. But um, I like talking about the, the ones where you're simulating an interaction with another human being. Mm-hmm. So I believe that uh, you know, our our software provides a safe space for you to experience those those interactions and practice different ways of saying things and 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 mastering the art of interacting with another person. When your customer facing employees have that confidence and they have the muscle memory on how to deal with typical scenarios that come up, you're going to be more successful. Their skills at, at dealing with customers is going to be improved. So it can only be a good thing for, mm-hmm, for the business. Mm-hmm. That repeatability that you talked about earlier. So it's almost like it becomes like second nature when you go face the customer directly, right? So yes, yes. Like one of the things that we want to, that, that, that our customers want to do is they want their customer facing employees to learn how to express empathy and make the customer feel heard and understood. So a lot of the simulations that that our software is used to, to do is you you have a, a customer who needs something or or is having a problem. Well, our software lets you practice saying things, and you and you can enter what are the phrases that you would want your employees to say when they're speaking, like "I understand," "I'm sorry to hear that," or "I can help you." When they run our simulations, that you know our software will score them. It picks up on them saying those things, and so when you run our simulations repeatedly, it becomes second nature. You're like, oh, I understand. And and then it becomes part of your muscle memory. Wonderful. I guess I referred to it as SaaS based. And for starters, what is SaaS? I guess I should have asked you to explain that earlier. Uh, Software uh, as a service. Just becomes accessible from wherever they need to, right? So is that like a good enough uh, layman explanation to someone that wants to know what SaaS is? It's basically any software you pay to have access to on a regular basis. Like it's you, it's, it's like YouTube TV. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you pay for mm-hmm. that. It's like, it's like mm-hmm. your, your good example there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, okay. that's a perfect example. Or Spotify, the premium Spotify, that's software as a service. Yes. Yes. And theater arts concentration from MIT looks like that's coming in handy with script writing for SimTrain, right? So all this power of digital storytelling so one would wonder, hey, how come Melanie is a chemical engineer, but seems like she has theater arts concentration also from MIT. So how is all that translating into what you're doing at work today? Oh, yeah, it's, it's totally relevant. I um, I 
went into theater arts at MIT because it, it sounded interesting and it also tapped into my longstanding love for, for, for stories and reading. And it is coming in very handy here because it, one of the things we learned was how to immerse ourselves in a character. And that I need to, I need to use that same ability now when I, uh, when I'm trying to relate to customers or when I'm trying to write a script, I have to immerse myself in the character, the, in the character of the script. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your message to girls say that are still hesitant about, you know, getting their hands dirty, getting to do like hands-on stuff, you know, like go drill a hole and do this, fix this, fix that. Would you just encourage them to still find routes that may be very interesting to them, but that can help them build confidence and help them create, say, like mobile app development and things like that, solving some real world problems that way? The only way to get the spatial skills is to get your hands dirty. I do think that for girls who just don't want to get their hands dirty, there's still value in um, they can, you know, they maybe they have a strong process mind and they can lay out like building a mobile app, you know, you're not obviously not going to get your hands dirty, literally, but you're still Mm -hmm. building something. So I still think there's value there. It won't maybe it will help you with the spatial thinking, but it will still help you with the act of like taking an idea out of your head and then creating something in the world that could be useful to someone else or even just to yourself. Mm -hmm. Again, still calls for a process design map and how to go about it and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever one can just get creative about, get creative with, that's strongly the message to just go after. Would you like to add anything else here, Melanie, that you think listeners can benefit whatever pointers you want to just offer? I guess the takeaway that I would have is to just allow yourself and allow your child time and space for your mind to roam. And I don't mean that just for kids. I mean that for yourself. I mean it for me too. Like I find that give my mind time to roam. That's when my most creative ideas come out. And so we need to be doing that for young people. We need to do that for our children. We need to give them, give them the time and space for their minds to roam because that's where creativity happens. That's where innovation happens is when they have space for crazy ideas to just become planted. And uh, the other thing I would say is just, I, I, the idea, once you get those ideas, just get it out of your head and just try it. Even if it's a, an idea that is that has come out into the world, you've tried to do something and failed, is far better than the perfect idea that never left your head. That's it. Just those two things. If there's a, nothing else you remember from this conversation, it's just those two things, time and space. And let that idea out of your head, even if it falls flat on its face. Let it, just get it out of your head. And is being a nerdy kid wrong not being one of those cool kids in the classroom nope there's nothing wrong with it because and i was one of them (laughs) i was one of those nerdy Mm -hmm, kids mm -hmm. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it Uh, just be yourself (laughs) all those dull moments can only breed creativity and so you know like you're definitely you know ahead of the pack in terms of how creative one can get even if you're not considered cool amongst classmates right so such a fascinating conversation melanie one more time so nice catching up with you and thank you so much for taking time to be with us on the show well thank you for having me thank you so much for the invitation it's always a pleasure and to listeners follow the podcast rate the podcast leave a review from your podcast app of choice and i will be back again with another interesting guest and another interesting topic follow me on instagram at, at yp kumar for all things digital media and lifestyle until next time it's me bye saying so long you